All right, so here's your period three retrospective, and I'm titling this lesson, The World on the Eve of Columbus. Um, but you're probably just thinking to yourself, this is the last history video of my freshman year. Right, so what do I mean when I say on the eve of Columbus, right? Period three of world history goes from 600 to 1450 CE, right? And, you know, when I was a kid, you know, elementary school kid, we used to, you know, cut out little pictures of Columbus's boat. We'd make little Columbus hats and sit in our little second grade reading circles and read about how awesome Columbus was. And this was the little nursery rhyme, right? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And when I was a kid, he was a heroic explorer. But, you know, just a couple months ago, my, my daughter came home, she's a fifth grader, and she says, you know, she starts telling me that Columbus was the worst guy in history, and I'm just thinking, you know, wow. So who is this guy? Was he a heroic explorer? Was he a selfish conqueror? I don't know. But what we cannot debate is his impact. And so let's look at the world in 1450, and then I want to take you into the world in 1750 and help you see some of those changes and really get you set up for world history too. All right, so here's the world in 1450. And any place that's gray is not dominated by a major political unit. And any place that's colored has a major political unit. So you can see in the Western Hemisphere, you know, there's the Iroquois around the Great Lakes and the bluish area are the, the people of Cahokia or the Mississippi River Valley civilizations. Uh, the Aztecs and the Inca, but that's it. I mean, the rest of the Western Hemisphere is, is gray. Most of Africa is gray, with the exception of the West African empires and the caliphates and emirates along the northern edge. Those are all Arab-dominated states. The green Swahili coast uh, or Swahili city-states on the east coast of Africa, but you know the rest of Africa is pretty much all gray. Australia's gray, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand's gray, all of Siberia's gray. The only dense parts of color are the original civilizations and Europe, right? So the Middle East, Mesopotamia, Egypt, North Africa, you know, Rome, uh, China, and India, you know, the, the, the original civilizations, that area is all densely colored with lots of powerful political groups pretty much everywhere in that area with the exception of some remote mountainous regions. And so the old world is still where all of humanity is, well, not all, but the most of humanity was and most things are taking place, at least in terms of civilizations right? World in 1450, right? The Mongol empires, including the Yuan dynasty of China, have retreated and collapsed. China is still the world's economic powerhouse, though, and the most economically and STEM sophisticated civilization on earth. But, you know, China has stopped its international trade expeditions because of some international internal political problems. And then always those, you know, stupid horse people to the north that are always causing the Chinese so much trouble. You know, there are some minor kingdoms in the rule of southwestern India, but the rest of the continent, subcontinent is pretty fragmented. The Muslim Ummah is fragmented into Egyptian, Persian, and Turkic centers of power. So it's kind of broken up at this point. The Abbasids have fallen. Eastern Europe is kind of reorganizing and reawakening after the fall of the Mongol Empire. But this time it's the rulers of Moscow that are starting to take the lead, not the Ukrainians. And that northward shift of power from Kiev to Moscow really defines Eastern European politics to this day. The Ottoman Turks in 1450 are three years away from toppling the Byzantine Empire and really getting rid of whatever was left of the Roman Empire. West Africa is a fragmented patchwork of kingdoms and small empires, still organized and stable and successful, but the power is shifting between Ghana and Songhe and Mali, and then sometimes there's threats from the north with the more Arab, uh, you know, coastal armies. Um, you know, and all throughout this, as we saw on the map, the Aboriginal Australians, the Southern Africans, the Pacific Islanders, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Native Americans, they don't know any of this is going on and they don't care either because they're still completely cut off from the world network. And the big change, I mean, the big, you know, 
player that's starting to emerge on the onto the world stage is Western Europe. And they're changing in some remarkable ways. They're starting to synthesize STEM learning from the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Arabs, the Indians, and the Chinese. Right? The Europeans didn't invent a lot of this stuff. They just were really successful in kind of gluing it all together. Their population is recovering quickly from the plagues. By 1450, they're back above the level where they were before the plagues. Um, there are a lot of agricultural improvements that are going on, which is leading to a population boom. Um, Europe is starting to shift away from religious superstition towards scientific rationalism. The church is starting to lose its power and it's really scientists and kings that are starting to take over. And books are becoming cheaper and more available uh, thanks to the invention of the printing press. Um, and Latin remains the language of the continent, right? Every European kingdom had its own local language like French or English or Dutch or whatever. But anyone who was educated on the continent spoke Latin, and so there was a single language of religion and science and trade that could help people stay, you know, somewhat together. You know, and out of the changes that took place in Western Europe, probably the biggest changes were along the Iberian Peninsula right here, the peninsula that includes Spain and Portugal. Um, and a lot of this came from the fact that Ferdinand of Castile and Isabel, uh, Isabella of Aragon married and united the kingdoms in 1469, and they started pushing the Moors, and these were the Muslims, out of Spain and back across the Straits of Gibraltar, I'm going to put an arrow back up here, and back down into Africa. They started pushing them out. And at the time, they were also, you know, taking advantage of some of these STEM improvements to start building more sophisticated ships. They'd learned a lot of things from the Chinese and the Arabs and had developed a lot of this technology themselves, and they were ready to go. And so in 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. He heads west towards what he thinks is a straight shot to China, but of course he ends up in the Caribbean on the island that includes modern-day Dominican Republic and Haiti and then, you know, sails around the Caribbean exploring all over the place. And in 1498, Vasco da Gama heads off south, goes around the Cape of Good Hope, which is southern Africa, and makes it as far as India. And so at this point, you know, it's on. The Western Europeans have discovered a whole new hemisphere, as well as a straight shot to Af around Africa that's going to allow them to get around the Turks who at this point have become very powerful in the Eastern Mediterranean and have blocked off the Silk Roads. Um, but, but the Europeans are really onto something here. And so, you know, let's fast forward, right? We've taken this tour of 1450. I want to jump ahead to 1750 real quick to really give you a sense of the change that's going on here, right? So by 1750, Spain and Portugal will rule all of the lands from Texas, from kind of the Texas-California line all the way down to Cape Horn, which is the southern tip of South America. And the British and the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and Portuguese will have colonies in Africa, India, China, Southeast Asia, Australia, the Pacific Islands, and North America. So really there's no continent, no population center that isn't in contact with the Europeans, and in many cases dominated by the Europeans just 300 years later. By 1750, Christianity will be the largest religion in the world taking over that spot from Islam. Western Europe will be the wealthiest civilization group in the world, uh, taking over that spot from the Chinese. By 1750, millions of Africans will be living or dead in the Americas or en route to the Americas. The population of Native Americans will have dropped by over 50%, in some places as high as 90%. Uh, the Ottoman Turks will rule the largest of the Muslim empires, incorporating all the old Byzantine lands, Egypt and, Egypt and parts of Arabia, Mesopotamia, and even Persia. Uh, Russia will rule the largest empire on earth by square miles, not by population, but by just absolute land mass. And China will be in steady decline due to European economic and military pressures. I mean, from the time they figured out how to get there, the Europeans wanted everything China had and they wanted to control China. 
By 1750, India will be under the control of the British. The British and French will be fighting the first wars that will lead to the American Revolution of 1776. The British and the Dutch will be starting to fight for control of South Africa. And the British will be a few decades away from sending their first colonists to Australia. So really some tremendous changes here um, to what the world map looks like. Um, you see some spread of population in the Americas and Western Hemisphere. Africa is going to remain largely, you know, organized into much smaller groups, you know, local tribes and small kingdoms. But, you know, we're starting to see vast shifts in terms of where the power lies, where the population lies, and who's in charge. And so this brings us to some final thoughts here on the eve of Columbus. Right? Were these Western Europeans like Columbus and da Gama, were they heroes or were they villains? And it kind of depends on who's writing the history and what their political biases and agendas are. In the United States, many states still celebrate Columbus Day and give kids a day off school, but in other places they've gotten rid of Columbus Day altogether and started to label him as a genocidal maniac. Um, you know, so you're going to have to figure out what your politics are and you're going to have to figure out what your values and beliefs are about the expansion of the Western Europeans in period four of world history. But no one can debate the changes that the world went through in a very short period of time. And so this is where you're going to start next year in period four of world history, looking at the breakout of the Europeans, a phenomenon that would define world history for the next 500 years. And so that's it. Thanks for watching.